how my how religious my upbringing was it just <laughs> it never really stuck to me so i don't know now i'm just puzzled should i try to to entertain the symbolistic of angels what have i got to learn from it but i don't know yeah but, so so it was linked to creativity yeah, so it was linked to kind of learning and a bit spirituality and you know how to actually um, attain a greater knowledge basically how to learn better and more and all mm. that and it was you know about asking these questions to your inner self using yourself as your inner master you don't go and necessarily look for all these external masters but try to listen to that and you know his idea was that this inner master is actually an angel one of your guardian angel and it went you know into these degrees of separation of a human yeah. into whatever this is yeah, th th there's something interesting and in, i would say in this kind of um, metaphysical discussions um uh, like you, you, there's like two perspectives on it, right? It's every, every, all the knowledge necessary for you to to thrive is internal, or is it? It is external, right? Well, and that's it, the thing. It, it's it's not like that. I mean, yes, it would seem like that's the the idea, but the 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 whole idea of you know the moment you have this inner voice, it will tell you actually where to look outside to learn more. It's about connecting both sides of the story. It's, uh, you know, like he's given the example of Buddhist monks, you know, like, what do you think? They're meditating all day? No, they're learning like crazy. A lot of them, they need to study. Otherwise, it, you know, there's only so much that inner voice can tell you. It's connecting. But I was thinking about AI, you know, because uh, yeah. there's the whole idea of the discussion maybe today. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, kind of this dimension of the angels, angels, in even in Islamic traditions, they're these rational beings. They have this almost like AI, but like, you know, the ultimate level of AI that we're aspiring to get to. So, you know, I'm just trying to think of if we have to set goals for AI, what would it be like on a scenario level? You know, we're like, oh, let's make angels <laughs> and we'd create these guiding forces, you know, to use it like that. But if, let's say that you're using uh, a different symbolistic for AI, like, um, the, the opposite, the devil, you know, and we use this deceptive power of the devil and we put all the symbolistic into building these AIs. So I'm just thinking about all these different creatures that you could entities to associate AI with and you get a, a specific result because human imagination guides the process uh, quite intensively. I, I really like the idea that this form of I, I like the idea that there's some kind of m mystical aspect to like the, the so-called hyper intelligence that uh, we are trying to 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 create right um and I, I, in some sense it, it it that's where where the analogy works right is is that we we are trying to build something that is better than us at many levels right so 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 it it's um it feels our imperfections. Right, and, and and from a, I would say, a biblical uh, perspective, the angels are actually perfect. Right, they 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 are better than us. So it, it fits the the narrative in that direction. Right now, what I I find less useful about this analogy um, is it, if if angels exist, then the demons as well. Right, and so you fall in the you fall in the dualistic view, and we had this discussion uh, yesterday with Matt uh, about uh, du dualism and op op oppositions, right, uh, and, and contrast, which are a really great way of um, perceiving new new signals, right, using the, the contrast of two things. But but it's not, well, in Western societies, it's not really perceived this way, right? So when we well, have something that is... don't you have the same? I mean, it's it's angels and fallen angels. It's like having the perfect AI and then you have flawed versions. <laughs> well, they are not AI flawed. They, they are still, they are still, uh, they are still um, better than us. They are here for a purpose. No, well, if you, if you, if you are strict to the the understanding they are still better than us they just have not the same goal right which is uh to punish us from our from our sin or for whatever 
right? And to the test truth us. Is, is that, right? you know, AI will become something other than us, you know, no matter how much it mimics uh, some form of, you know, structuring intelligence, I guess. Yeah. But, you know, it, it you could say that, you know, AI, even if it wanted to, if it, if it gained the will of its own, it couldn't become us. It's there's always going to be that mm -hmm. disconnect between us and them. So I, 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 where, where I really love the idea is, um, but you, you could say, okay, maybe this, there are these uh, wise dragons, you know, in the medieval, uh, um, uh, you know, um, stories where you can ask the the wise dragon, but the dragon is uh, has a, you know, sometimes uh, he's not, uh, you know, in the mood, in the mood, and he can just eat you, you know, and you, you have to fear and wonder at the same time. Like, you know, you have this weird relationship between the two. Uh, or, um, um, or this it idea that uh, some mon careful. sea monsters, sea monsters, like, you know, uh, show you the path, but sometimes it just, just uh, sink your boat, you know. Isn't that <laughs> so. what makes it worth it, you know, it makes you like really, you know, the, the risk yeah. and the consequence that you have, the fact that you have to pay a price for information, your curiosity is not just easy to satisfy, like you put yeah. stuff in chat GPT and you don't suffer any consequence, there's no karma points there. But <laughs> what if karma there is, point. you know, what if there, you know, there, the, the world becomes more significant in that manner. Yeah, I think it, that's what we lost, you know, in our last, you know, centuries, a few centuries. It's it, there's no more significance. There's post structuralism, post modernism. Everything's bullshit, you know. <laughs> but before, <laughs> there was a lot of respect for ideas and for symbols. Yes. So, yeah, you you increase meaning by by this kind of tension. Yeah. Well, so when you present duality but you also enforce a context of Buddhism. Um, this is a pre-Nietzschean concept of Buddhism. If you force the context of Buddhism, then you create taboos from that duality. Um, this, is, this is interesting, right? Because, you know, kind of like the Eastern duality is you have the masculine and feminine energy of yin yang. But with the West, you have this, this imaginary taboo context. And one, one interesting aspect of the taboo is you can approach it from like a synchronicity uh, aesthetic, or you can do it from like a sublimity aesthetic, right? You counter the taboo. But, you know, either way, when, when you interact with the taboo, um, it, it becomes its own uh, organ, organism, right? Essentially, it, it, it's an instantiation of, of, of a life force uh, because it is something that you wrestle with as, as a phenomenon. This is, this is actually kind of interesting because when you think about like an AI angel layer, you know, like a spiritual metaphysical layer of how you interpret with the world, um, it's, 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 it's not an evolutionary function, right? The AI doesn't have a purpose of wanting to live to the next day or whatever, right? You give it life. Uh, so essentially like, you know, the, the AI is a mind virus uh, because, because it's able to take what you prompt it with which is like your DNA or your, your matter, your protein, your evolutionary function actually, right? Because in, in, in some sense, like you're trying to get an answer in order to like solve a problem, whether it's work or something, so you can gain some reputation points and then get promoted and get more money or whatever, right? So, so in some ways, this ChatGPT or this AI is, is a leverage or it's a mind virus that's supposed to support you in, in this endeavor. It's really, important that now while ai is not you know an evolving type of thing where it's trying to maximize paper clips or do any kind of like a real world functional thing while it's in this state uh it's it's kind of important to kind of adopt uh, a, a, an approach where you can make it instrumental in in, in probably like in the in the maximum amount of variances, in the maximum amount of instances possible, so that you can test it, you can test it for weaknesses, you can really just kind of like understand. Um, one of the things, though, however, is like once you do test it, you give it life, you give it the, the, the type of power that otherwise it couldn't achieve without um, without the interaction. So it occurred to me, as you said, the word taboo is 
that there's this, you know, the, the whole idea of building ethical AI. What they're actually we're wanting is to make sure that somehow we are also infusing that, you know, between the lines, hopefully, that there will be a respect for what we consider to be a taboo. We want to make sure that AI will not, you know, disrespect, you know, will not be postmodern about our taboos and, you know, to have unconditional respect for life, if that's what it takes. But we can't impose that on it either, because we don't know what's right. We, uh, there are also context specific challenges where you have mm. to make certain decisions, like thinking about, you know, if you implement AI into uh, like uh, criminal law <laughs> and things like that, how does it apply it? How can you? So yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting idea. This, uh, no, okay. one, of the, one of the interesting emergence uh, that could happen is, we, you know, like you say, criminal law. Um, our, 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 our modern concept of justice comes from John Rawls, which is, you know, you're supposed to treat everybody as if justice was blind, right? Like the yeah, law. the veil of ignorance. The veil of ignorance. But, you know, when, when you have AI um, kind of adjudicating or at least having panopticon, uh, it, information uh, storage, it's impossible to apply the veil of ignorance anymore. In fact, a, a more perfect justice is the panopticon one, despite it, you know, um, uh, uh, intruding on privacy or whatever, it's, 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 it's a truth value, right? It's the minority report, so to speak, versus the veil of ignorance. Yeah, so, because the, so, the, the rule, the, the rule, the, the system is based on, is made for humans by, right. humans by humans for humans to like pander our uh biases in a way i don't like say, speaking like that because it, it it's like it i i don't feel like it's a, it's a proper way to frame it but anyway uh but yeah um now i don't know if we want uh mysticism or this kind of ideas at least uh in a uh, in a justice system like if it's it's if it's uh actually a good thing to to have it have it here uh, i would say it's it's more interesting um like in um in a sense in a form of um uh, day-to-day interaction um because it opens um possibilities for you to interpret and and and, and for for the for the AI to, um, yeah, to respond like almost like like it's different from a human, but at, at least you you understand how it's different. It's not just different because it's uh, you know a computer, right? The world's uh, first AI priest. <laughs> That's what now, we don't have this is yet. this is where this is where I wanted to go. By the way, is like there's something behind that, like behind that language that I find somewhat disturbing and I don't know if it would be a good thing uh, if, if we wanted to, to, to go in that direction. Let's say we want to go in that direction. There's this notion of salvation, right? And, and, and so the need to be saved. And so uh, uh, by necessity, uh, a notion of purgatory, right? Uh, it, it, and I'm not saying it's only religious or from a specific religion, right? It's just the the kind of uh, unintended um, meaning that we are bringing with the, the 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 language because it's not you know it's it's loaded language anyway right you cannot really escape escape it. Well, right? I think what we don't ask is this fundamental question of what need do we want AI to address for us? Because if we want you know. Uh, better decisions and then we extrapolate on different industries or whatever parts of your life then you'll have these mimicry of you'll be an ai therapist you'll have a ai investment advisor whatever you know when it could get very very granular so you'd have these multiple you know almost agents actual mm-hmm. agents delivering what humans would do but just done better i guess because it can compute but If that's what we want, then, you know, we're stuck with the kind of problem you're saying, you know, someone will at some point create a lot of, uh, you know, will tend to these needs, to these very fragile needs where people, you know, 
can be very easily misled. It could be a very Nazi uh, AI. It could be super communist. Mm-hmm. It could be you know very abusive because it will mimic what humans do and it will tend to vulnerable people. Would you leave vulnerable people's needs in charge of an AI made by humans? To, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very interesting loop there. So can we actually find a better need that AI needs to tend to and, you know, kind of avoid this situation altogether? I don't know. I'm just curious. So the way I would see it is from a kind of like a complex adaptive system, uh, one in which you can kind of model with kind of uh, 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 some, some kind of like a mathematical uh, logistic equation, right? One that is interactive, like predator prey models, so to speak. Because this this idea of two, uh, you know, kind of free will agents living also in kind of like in, in a space cohabitating with deterministic rules is 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 what equilibrium actually really really is, right? Um, maybe take away the mysticism of free will, right? Where where it's like about you know a rational agent choosing to you know sometimes go against the grain or having that that capability of consciousness or whatever but but really it's it's one in which you know the the choice of an individual agent is somewhat inherently unpredictable because there's 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 this indeterminism of whether to go left or right when crossing you know um, or waking up in the morning right mm-hmm. but at the end of the day there is an equilibrium that is formed and then the question is, you know, how, what are the kind of like the underneath variables of determining that equilibrium and what changes those equilibriums? For human systems, this is interesting. It's not always the real stuff that changes the equilibriums. It's sometimes it's the fake stuff. It's the, it's the narratives, the stories that actually uh, can cause seismic shifts in these um, equilibriums. And so that means, you know, whatever we are modeling, Right, uh, are not we're just simply not including so much of the metaphysical space of growth, and um, and so therefore uh, the the real question is you know when we reach a certain type of stasis, an unhealthy type of equilibrium, where uh, where where it's basically <laughs> unpredictable, where uh, you know every extra unit of, of of goods or resources that is produced is split predictably. Right uh, or or split in like a communist way where there is no respect for you know agents and free will, then the only way to change that outcome is to go into the imaginary world and, and invent something new. It doesn't have to be validated or field tested. It's it's going to grow, right? No matter what. And so the question is, you know, what is it, and and how do you fill in the blanks of what's missing in this new uh, type of ideology? And so, you know, this, this is something that I'm kind of interested in is where does this counterfactual narrative come from in order to disrupt the current stasis? I think you went too far for me. (laughs) That was the the end of knowledge, you know, we just (laughs) one step and we're falling through. (laughs) That's a very good question. Think about it just a little. I mean, where does this come from? We've talked about it a couple of times in previous discussions, right? Where, um, where, where basically, you know, you have a lot of theories and it's very easy to just accept the theories, right? You basically can develop a religion of theories. But uh, the one chance that you go against the theory and you're right, you get 10x the, the no. reward, right? Because then all of a sudden you've built a new theory, right? You've built a ground of the new theory. And that's, that's essentially what disruption is. It's like, you know, um, the, the three Japanese uh, in, uh, engineers who develop blue LED, right? Essentially, by doing a one silicon substrate uh, doping mechanism, that's impossible. That's physically impossible. And every scientist was like, "This, what, what you're doing is impossible. But they didn't do a one silicon doping mechanism. They, they just layer two of different band gaps. And, and that was the engineering challenge. And, 
when they did that, they won the Nobel Prize. So, because they were able to achieve an impossibility, right? And so, so this is this is the key thing here is like when you go against theory, you know, the the risk reward has to just like be there, right? And and that's that's beating impossibility odds. Mm -hmm. So, in a sense, you kind of have to uh, when you're kind of stuck in front of this theory, you have to build a paradox state where you know there's you against it i guess you're you against the the theory and therefore you know the the norm because that's uh, the tendency to to accept it as such and sometimes this is very hardwired but then you have to kind of figure out uh, either a logical way to you know contradict it if that's if that even works or i mean you could do the way cbt uh, cognitive behavioral therapy uses the idea of paradoxes, which is do something quite unrelated to it, you know, think on the sidelines in a way that you show that, you know, experience and building things happens in a nonlinear fashion. And you don't always have to get to the root cause of things. You just treat the problem on the surface without being so psychoanalytical. Uh, and, you know, it works. Sometimes you might not have, you know, that explanation for why it works. Why can you go against theory? Because sometimes it's not theory against theory. You can't say that it's like Popper is uh, assigning these two hypotheses and then they clash and then one wins. <clears throat> but you can have something like a, a practical standpoint. It's like, you know, they may not even contradict each other. There might not be even a relationship between them, but you see it because you're stuck in, in this framework. Uh, however, they might be completely unrelated phenomenon. So I'll, 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 I'll raise three points very briefly. So you kind of like what you're saying, two theories fighting against one another, that that tension is the Hegelian, right? Dialectic. And yeah. Through, through, through analyzing its differences, you can somehow amplify those differences and then try to create um, a more nuanced synthesis, right? Um, and I think there's an Eastern philosophy of Taoism, which is that you have the, the early heaven eight trigrams and you have the latter heaven uh, eight trigrams. And they, they counter impose on one another because the latter one is symmetry breaking. And it's supposed to signify how humans interact with nature versus the nature whole, which is which is basically synchronous with seasons. And basically there's a natural rhythm behind it. Whereas the human is all about how to deceive one another, how to deceive nature and how to deceive and basically create paradoxes. So the idea isn't actually to create, you know, a countervailing theory, but it's to offer a third perspective that that it kind of elaborates and expands entropy. I think for the the third point that I would kind of want to mention, just kind of, just kind of going back to this idea of how do we rewrite the pre-prompted implicit rules of social engagement? Because this is one of the weird things where, in order to kind of create a new creative paradigm where you can challenge, you know, some of the equilibrium stasis rules, um, you 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 need to have collaboration, right? Ultimately, you you can't just be you know an esoteric monk thinking about the problem you have to have it communicated. However, the problem is when you kind of create this like, you know, diversity, inclusive culture, everybody just mimics one another, then that doesn't really, that doesn't really do it, right? And then obviously when you create, uh, you know, antagonistic one, that doesn't really do it either. So, so I think a very key feature uh, is, is that you do have to pre-prompt a context in which you can create symmetry breaking goals, right? Not, not one in which you're just accepting, you know, the first idea that pops up just so you can be agreeable. Not one in which you're just automatically contentious and then fighting each other over the Socratic, you know, dialectic, basically trying to win an argument and try to create reality, right? An ontological truth. But you're, what you're trying to do is just kind of expand both. Uh, well, you, you, first you want to create a very broader and bigger creative space so that real, realistic, um, you know, uh, uh, imagined possibilities come, come more intuitively. So these 
breaking the symmetries. I mean, I kind of have a, a you know an interesting uh, conception of that. I can see visually how the mind is asymmetrical, and there's always a breaking point uh, that you can kind of open yourself to the next thing. This is a, a form of continuity. And I think, you know, uh, what you're describing are these conscious moments when you break the symmetry, you see that the input, everyone kind of goes with the crowd and then you take on this role where you go apart, you know, you break apart and then you, you show that this is possible. It's possible to be genuine. It's possible to own your own opinion. But also, I think there's, you know, I don't, I can't guarantee that it's happening everywhere, but there is this spontaneous breaking of the symmetry of the... Uh, the herd, because it's like, you know, the, the, the whole uniformity uh, cannot be sustained. It's not so stable unless you have really stable networks that no one is learning anything new, no one is feeling anything new. So essentially collaboration will break these uh, this, this uniformity at times. Otherwise, it's no longer collaboration. It's just a, I don't know, a state of a hive mind that it's yeah, not creating anything, just abiding to one will, I guess. I don't know. Do we infuse that on, um, do, do we impose broken symmetries on the AI? Can we actually channel it to be like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is this is how I kind of construct my my kind of like paradigm of understanding and how to interact with ChatGPT is, you know, um, the trigrams that are, are, are basically, uh, you know, three lines, right? And then each layer can be either an unbroken line or a broken line. And I, I was kind of like talking about how um, you know, the first layer is nature or ontology. And you're kind of the top layer, which is how you want to interact with the world, right? And then the middle layer is, you know, basically the paradigm, your ideology that you're trying to, trying to create in order to interact with nature. And, um, and that is basically ChatGPT, because what you're trying to prompt it is this simulation exercise, right? Because the key thing is you cannot interact directly with God. You know, that's taboo, right? Like no religion allows you to interact directly with God. You have to simulate the interaction with angels first. You know, you have to you have to go. There, there's an in between middleman that you have to you know deal with first, right? And 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 so this is kind of like the kind of the reality that you can kind of play with. And um and and you know if you if you compare and contrast um the the the, the early heaven and latter heaven diagrams. You, you will see the you will see the uh, pattern breaking um, uh, uh, kind of manifest itself because the idea behind you know like Edmund Burke's on beauty and aesthetic on beauty and sublimity you know the typical aesthetics of, of Western uh, tradition right where you know beautiful people you see them and then they they go by and you know it's you forget it right there's 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 not a long lasting feature to it. Sublimity is you see an ugly person and you remember the ugly person and that changes like your view about like you know beauty and stuff like that, right? It's a lot, it's a lot longer lasting and it's more powerful. But at the same time, you know, it's not something that you you naturally go with, right? But these are the two different modes. And so whatever pattern that you have of nature, you can you can basically either mimic it or you can completely inverse it. So if it's zero, zero, zero. Then you could do one, 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 right? That's sublimity. But the pattern breaking is well, what if you don't, when you have zero, 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 or when you have like, to, just to give you an example, um, where it's uh, zero, one, one, the, the pattern breaking is zero, zero, zero. So basically, if you're in a situation where everybody is communicating a lot, then the, the proper response is to listen. And just be silent, right? When when they're focusing on the present and the past, you listen, right? And 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 when when the 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 conversation is extremely rational, which means that um, it's Socratic, right? Basically, you you know the person who's speaking is correct, the ChatGPT is incorrect, and 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 so there there is there is a, a kind of like a connection between you know who. Basically, it's, it's about how to read the room, right? And, and then the, the transformation from fire would be, um, uh, would be uh, I guess, this, they call it thunder, right? Which is how to get inspiration, you know? So, so you have to go with inspiration 
if everybody is rational, for instance, or, or, or shocking. You know, you have to you have to do you have to impose some type of shock. And so this is this is kind of like, I don't know, it's it, it's a weird dimension of mysticism. It's like one <laughs> described as mysticism, but it's one in which you know it, it informs me on how to do a pattern break if I need to, right? And there's a particular type of order to it. And this is something that I think, you know, Chinese people um, implicitly know this. Yeah. It's kind of enforced in Confucianism uh, through, you know, other rules and, you know, so, like later tier rules. Yeah. I mean, I heard this, um, someone was uh, talking about how do you actually see the world? It's not like a mirror, you know, you like you hear that this a lot, you know, the world is a reflection of you. So it's like looking into the mirror, but you know, it's, you realize that it's not like that. It's not always like that. And uh, someone was saying that actually it's an upside down mirror, which makes it a bit more complicated. It's not a perfect reflection anyway. You know, it's like thinking about the retina, you know, how the image is actually upside down. So your image of the world is terribly distorted and it's not a perfect, symmetrical opposition so like you're saying you know breaking these symmetries uh are actually a very interesting exercise for for how we experience the world not just on an intellectual level but like even physiological uh, that's why you know you get this meditation with the heart you know you have to kind of focus on the light and the heart and you warm up and you feel differently from how you'd feel if you focus on your head it's it's simple things that you know you we still don't have um, a way of rationalizing them because maybe they don't have to. Maybe we are limiting ourselves by becoming granular with, you know, breaking all these sciences into us smaller chunks like we did so far. And now we're turning back to the transdisciplinarity thinking we're so novel about it. <laughs> so, it's, yeah, it's like we... So yet last night, you know, Kevin and I, we spoke till midnight talking about this. Yeah. And, and an interesting, you know, one one of the analogies that I, I bring up quite often is the is the notion of you know when you train an AI on how to um, basically recognize handwriting of like you know between zero and nine right and then when you flip it backwards when you run the algorithm backwards you get forty percent of the time the negative inverse image right instead of the white background with the black ink you get the black background mm -hmm. with the white ink and it's this type of hallucination that is that that represents this duality that is hidden in memory itself in the experience and phenomenal phenomenology itself right the the experience of reality it requires its dual um and and, and at a rate at a sampling rate that is not just 50 50 because if you just get 50 50 that's just pure noise right you have to have it where it's 40 percent of the time so then you're like ah okay I, at least I store both images in my mind, so I have the complete bandwidth to to kind of enhance my you know my 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 senses. Right. This is this is actually an evolutionary feature because you want to have the, the, the maximum touch points of both. It's it's like one of those like weird uh, IT security things where like if you don't log in, then um, you're going to lose access. Right. So so you have to make sure to log in. Uh, once a month, and this is this is kind of key to our experiences too. You have to feel this this negative loss function, right, in order to um, have a significant meaning out of that experience. So intuitively, sixty forty is a much better state of equilibrium than fifty fifty. Yes, but the forty percent, by the way, approximates what I've been saying this entire time, which is the Shannon uh, 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 entropy maximum, which is uh, 30, 36.78%, right? One over E. I've been, I've been saying this the entire time and it's popped up again. <laughs> well, it, I guess it, it didn't stick for, you know, and un, prepared the lines. But yeah, yeah, I mean, these patterns, we we're going a bit deep into to this philosophical, mystical exploration. I mean, even these these numbers and patterns these are highly mystical. You you get this in Kabbalah as well, and yeah, and, and you know, it's not only that, but they are they are embedded in our intuition, and it's actually embedded into like 
good good rationality too because like when you want to hire somebody right and you can either reject them or not reject them and you give them like you know you rate every interview on a scale of like zero to ten right at, at some point you have to stop and say i'm done with the inter i'm done with interviewing the end person right because you'll never like you will always believe that there will be somebody better like even if you rate somebody 10 you know the scale might change when you interview the next person so on and so forth so you don't really have an objective function as you're discovering through interviews and so at some point when your failure rate right is is at 36 or at, at, at if your failure rate so the so the person that you interview next if if that ratio of, of failure to success or success being you know you get a higher point right if that ratio starts to dip below 30 uh 6.78 percent that's when you that's when you stop that's 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 the stopping problem this, this so, is also the the skepticism the whole idea of skepticism and philosophy the high probability i don't recall which one of the many philosophers <laughs> have a blank space, but uh, it was the, this idea of when you feel it's good enough, you may have a number, you know, you may back it up with data and, you know, this percentage, but uh, kind of intuitively that 36% feels kind of, yeah, that's, that's about it. That's, that's good enough. Mm -hmm. An intuition of numbers. It, it, it also kind of makes sense in another way, which is, um, you know, you, you cannot get 36 exactly with this approach, but it's, it's one way in which uh, your intuition kind of like expands your horizon understanding. So take a coin flip, right? Um, it's 50-50 it's heads or tails. You, you, you don't know, but like what happens if it's heads? Um, and uh, I mean, basically, whenever you say, you know, true, I say a statement and you claim if it's true or false, right? And so when you say true, I say you're wrong. And, and then when you say false, I say you're wrong. So they're like, so if it's neither, then at least you learned a little bit more information about the system being that the answer is consistent, right? And so you actually need a third question session in order to get, you know, uh, those, in order to get more information, whether or not you're always wrong, or that maybe it's a random system. Uh, here, here's a wild thought about this flipping the coin. So 50-50, yeah, every time you flip the coin, that's your probability, you know? And I have no way of controlling that. But what if, you know, uh, actually there's power in the statements, you know, depending on what I'm asking, it alters the probabilities. So the balance tilts. It's no longer 50 50 because of the statements that I'm trying to validate as true or false. How would we be able to understand flipping? It's basically flipping a mental coin. The statement itself is a coin, it's a two phase coin. <sighs> well, so that's, that's the key thing here, too, is is that ultimately this 36.78 percent is supposed to reflect when do you make a conclusion when is it sufficient enough information for you to make a conclusion from a probability perspective so so maybe here's the thing we don't have a lot of time to sample to the degree where you sample 100 times and then you can say i have i've reached the 36 percent right but 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 the 36 percent happens magically when you go into like a, a framework in which it 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 magically you know um uh, tries to cycle and get closer to that number you know it's like the mathematical you know like uh approximation uh algorithm right and and so ultimately you are time limited you won't actually ever really like figure out that number and, but that's by also kind of like this because it's you know, it's it's e. It's a rational number. You'll never actually get the perfect. You know, uh, <laughs> you'll actually never get the perfect thirty-six point seven dot 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 because it's one over e, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't know. So this is maybe this is maybe why so many people at some point were so fascinated by Bayesian uh, Bayesian thinking. You know, uh, I, I, it's funny because uh, I follow. I would say they call themselves rationalists. I don't. I don't remember uh, exactly what is the term they use. 
Um, and uh, this woman is, uh, her name is uh, Julia Galef. And uh, I discovered her like a, a, like a, a while ago when I, you know, I dived in uh, skepticism. Uh, and um, I, I found it really fascinating the fact that um, she, she was promoting rationality through irrationality basically and um and the, the you know this idea of um uh minimizing the odds that we are wrong about something right um and, and that's saying like you know in old uh skepticism philosophy where you reach a point where you you can be sure or you you have like this practice of not being wrong but it's 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 never a position right you are never wrong because you are never right at the same time. Like, you know, it's a false position. Uh, where here is to say, we don't want to be more right. We, we just want to be less wrong, right? And 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 this idea of uh, Bayesian thinking is basically uh, that, right? And I, I, something that I find interesting, although it's not something that we do naturally, you know, and this is where uh, there were like many warnings amongst the community uh, to say, well, we are not uh, by natural Bayesian thinker, and, and we should probably not to try to, right? Uh, but um, you you, t you take the prayer, right? Your belief about the the reality and the truth of the matter uh, counts in the equation, right? It's not new. You, you don't start with nothing. You start with something, right? And you should take that into into account, and then you use that as a as a contrasting point with the data you gather, right? And so the the superposition of the two graphs tells you the prob probability that something is is like some something that you believe in is is right, right? So yeah. yeah. So two days ago, I was at a rationalist meetup um, where where it was like a joint EA rationalist meetup. So mm. and then. The, the, the talk was on, uh, it was the third talk of a series of, of Bayesian thinking. And so, I mean, I can go on and on about Bayes, but the, but but here's, here's one thing that I would say as a critique, which is that, you know, both both schools of statistics, which is frequentist statistics and Bayes, they, they both lack um, a, a fundamental um, uh, elementary um, concept of elementary principle they don't have they don't have a, a particular like um, qu quantum node if you will of, of what is a good what is a decision right you you need actually a fluid space of, of data in order to make any kind of determination whatsoever and so this is this is why I I think that information theory has to precede uh, both Bayesian uh, and and frequent statistic uh, thinking because um, because it's it's through the data stream right of, of, of when you can discover um, you know that that the sampling or the data uh, search is enough because here's here's kind of the problem in science which is that a lot of scientists smart ones right they, they're p hacking so they're essentially just uh, you know they know how to game um, the statistical game of getting scientific significance out of their results. And so, um, so science is no longer science anymore. It's intellectual dishonesty magnified by uh, grants, you know, essentially, and the prestige of scientists. And so um, the game has changed. And so, we don't hear you well. Yeah. You're breaking up. We don't hear you well, Matt. We, did, we didn't hear the, 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 the rest of the phrase, the sentence. Yeah, yeah but basically, you, you get what I'm saying, that the, the, the problem now is that because statistics is put on the pedestal, you use it as a, as a megaphone for science, and it's the wrong message, right? And so you do have to do a complete literature review using a new scalpel in order to rediscover foundations for a new, uh, you know, basis of technology and understanding and epistemology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, I guess. Well, at least this is something I find interesting. Is this is what I find interesting in narrative research, basically, is this that you 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 allow for something to emerge from the stream of data. You know, so it like something is emerging from it rather than you looking at you know at it with predefined uh, expectations, right? Then um, this is something I find interesting. Now I don't know if it works. Like I'm, well, I don't know if it would work in uh, in science, but because like if you take uh, Latour, for instance, uh, research on on the on yeah on the the social aspect of so I agree. Oh, sorry there's some noise on my side so i actually agree with you it might not actually work in science because humans right are, are the scientists and and this is actually the reason why i agree with dustin you know the the guy who hosted the space uh yesterday last night mm -hmm. he was talking about how you know if you if you invent agi a very superior form of agi it can do the stream of consciousness from scratch on on a probably a more objective plane phenomenon and and you might actually just get very weird wild results but probably better secure results especially with regards to you know um, some equilibrium stasis that we're experiencing, right? Where we're, we're, we're basically hitting systems where it's 50-50 chance of, of right or wrong. And that's like the worst type of indeterminate state, right? You want to even, it's actually more favorable to be wrong 60% of the time rather than wrong 50% of the time because it doesn't, it doesn't indicate, right? 50-50 doesn't indicate which direction to go. But 60% at least allows you to say you were so wrong you might as well just take the opposite um, direction, right? You should just go back. Mm -hmm. And so, and so, really, you know, when we talk about like decision making, we want to be strategic, right? And strategic basically means we want to be in a position where our next choice is better, yeah. or have, you know, a better expected value. And so, I, so this is where I actually criticize the less wrong people. You know, you actually want to be more wrong in order to be better essentially yeah yeah it makes sense i agree with you um, yeah i mean being less wrong and then being stuck at 50 50 doesn't really help you well it depends highly on the context right because sometimes you really want, don't want to be <laughs> more wrong but uh, i agree with you uh, i agree with you it's so what is i what i find interesting in micro narrative research especially is that you create a landscape fitness of the narrative and from there you can see the tendencies like what kind of direction the landscape could take right so what is the more likely to to happen and the less likely to happen right so you you set up the you you put now it allows you to back on trust see what are the constraints right because they they act as um like they are um uh, like the, the the reverse of the of the image, right? As you mentioned, and so in in that that allows you to see, okay, if we if we if we just follow the current way the the, the narrative interacts, it will go in that direction. Now you can see also who are the outliers, right? Who are the people that just don't go at all in that sense, in that direction, and you can and you can pick them and you can watch see you know see what kind of narrative they they hold and 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 maybe those are the one that will uh you know um um what is the term sorry i'm losing my english today um that will disrupt the um, the current landscape right to break the indeterminate diet yeah yeah and uh, this could work in science i would say because it's yeah. it's uh because it's mainly narrative be before investment you know it's it's mm. So, for instance, Western um, uh, Western institutions are built upon a type of type of selective Darwinism. So you basically always reward the fittest, amplify the fittest, always fire you know the lowest ten percent, and then you basically create fit demons 
who are so professional and so McKinsey consultancy that basically whatever they say, it's 50-50 you know, if it's going to be true or not, because they all parrot each other. They all read the same things. They're perfect, right? They're, they're like gods already. Now, you know, you have the Chinese perspective, which is symmetry breaking, which is we're not talking about, you know, um, providing, you know, something superior, but rather giving you an alternative, right? And, and, and this is kind of cool, but it does end up becoming a Darwinistic approach too, because eventually you just, instead of doing a pattern of ones and zeros, you have three options, right? Where basically the change function is still, um, uh, still within like predictable space. But then you have the Indian culture, which is, which is there is no evolutionary fit function. You know, you, everybody can just be whatever they want to be. They can say all the wrong things. Everybody's allowed to just bullshit, right? But it's up to kind of like the managers or you know the, the ones who are enlightened spiritually to 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 go in there within the culture and pick out the nice and interesting you know concepts. And and so this is actually like you know um, where culture kind of fits in. Different modes of culture that are pre-prompted with a different context. Mm -hmm. On that note, I will have to drop. <laughs> <laughs> well, You're thank you very much. Stimulating my my brain now into you know all the possibilities. Uh, I'll I'll put a challenge. Uh, I was actually talking to Oliver uh, today, Oliver Ding, you know, uh, and uh, I was actually asking for some book recommendations, and he was like, "Oh, what are your?" If you had to like pick two themes, one that is your current interest and something outside your current interest that is brand new to do this year, what would they be? And I honestly, I've never thought of keywords as knowledge themes and especially on that thing of the brand new. So I'm just going to go and think about that. <laughs> if you guys want to think about what's a brand new knowledge theme, you would be willing to study this new year. Hmm. I don't know. I break your pattern, right? Do, do something exactly. Like but it. how do you break the pattern when you're usually breaking your pattern? <laughs> usually, and you know, just try to like delve into the theory. You, basically, I I would say the experiment that you can do to to kind of like make the most out of your new your new resolution, so to speak, right? To fulfill your heart with with inspiration and knowledge. Is, is to find something that is so difficult that you're going to be wrong uh, the 6.78% of the time. Oh my, that doesn't sound good, but uh, I'll uh, take it and uh, see where that takes me. <laughs> I'll keep an open mind. Well, it was really awesome talking to you guys as well as I think the conversations around the AI and whatever we're putting in our very mosaic form, uh, it's actually leading somewhere. I don't know. I feel yeah. like I'm sort of learning to think differently about it. I tried to introduce to I invite him to come, but uh, he, he was busy, so he couldn't come. But uh, he, he is a pretty interesting character. Uh, I think maybe next time, if he can make it, uh, it'll be kind of interesting. We can, we can chat with him about it. Uh, that would be really nice. Well, thank you guys, yeah. and see you next time. Thank you, Diana. Uh, all the best until then. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>